Tonight, the trafficking of girls in Canada. We follow undercover officers to see how hard this is to stop and who's at risk. New rules for airline passengers and what you can carry on. Why are some knives suddenly okay? But we begin with some engagement news you might have heard about and a most uncommon royal to be. So no surprise, American actress Meghan Markle said yes to Prince Harry, somehow agreeing to leave behind her temporary home of Toronto, her TV show Suits, and her privacy. She is signing up for a life of constant scrutiny and endless public appearances, but she and he apparently are all in. I know that I'm in love with this girl, and I hope that she's in love with me, but we still had to sit down on the sofa, and I still, you know, I still had to have some pretty, you know, frank conversations with her to say, look, you know, what you're letting yourself in for is, mm. it is, it's, it's a big, it's a big deal. And it's, um, you know, it's not, I wouldn't, it's not, it's not easy for anybody. Um, the ring... In that first interview together, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle talked about how they met, how they managed to keep their relationship private for so long and the challenges they'll have to tackle. Their moments before the cameras are obviously just a taste of what's to come. Thomas Degla was right there on the sidelines at Kensington Palace today in the midst of all the excitement. I'm standing outside Kensington Palace at the moment. It's a frenzy like no other. That feeling in Britain when the House of Windsor is about to grow a little bigger and royal watchers can't get enough. We were all anticipating it. And um, yes, and now that it's actually happened, it's you know, very exciting. We've been waiting for Harry to meet, to meet the right woman. So I'm, I'm very happy for them, yes. Some TV crews had been waiting outside Kensington Palace for days, with speculation fueled by tabloid pictures of Meghan Markle shopping in London. Now she's moving in and better get used to the attention. She'll have royal protection wherever she goes. She won't just be able to nip out to the shops and not think they're going to be camera crews in, everywhere. 17. Today's first order of business as a newly engaged couple, a photo op. This gives you a sense of the media frenzy around this engagement. About 100 media crews lined up just to get that first shot of Harry and Meghan as an engaged couple. Every crew having to draw a number we drew number 70. Then, as the world watched, they stepped out, giving those cameras plenty to see from a safe distance, as if to start a fresh relationship with the press on their own terms. And just like that, it was over. But later in the day, a first interview for Harry and Meghan together. I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. I don't think either of us did that. We both said that, even though we knew yeah, I, that it would be. Yeah, I tried to. I tried. I tried to warn. I tried to warn you as much as possible. They plan to get married in the spring. The bookies are even taking bets on the wedding date. The odds-on favorite, sometime in May. The frenzy is only beginning. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. So let's talk about that rock on Meghan Markle's finger. Every royal ring has a backstory, and here's this one. The ring was designed by Prince Harry himself, and the center diamond comes from Botswana, where the couple celebrated Markle's 36th birthday. The two side diamonds were part of a brooch worn by Harry's mother, Diana, and the gold band was crafted by Cleve & Company, the Queen's jewelers. Estimated value, $85,000. Now, the couple made it clear they cherished Diana's connection to their engagement. You know, to be able to have this, which sort of links where you come from and Botswana, which is important to us, and it's, uh, it's perfect. What do you think your mother would have thought of Meghan or said about Meghan? At least they'd be thick as thieves, <laughs> <laughs> without question. I think she would be over the moon, jumping up and down, you know, so excited for, for me. But then, as I said, we'd have probably been best friends, best friends with Meghan, so no, it's... I, you know, it's, it is days like days like today when when I really miss having her around and miss being able to share the, the happy news. But you know, with with the ring and with everything else that's going on, I'm sure she's. Uh, she's with us. I'm sure she's with us. Yeah, you know, jumping up and down somewhere else. Tina Brown, the former editor of Vanity Fair and The New Yorker, knows the British upper crust very well. She also wrote a best-selling biography of Diana. So today, I asked her about this latest royal bride. Well, it brings a whole other gust of, of, of renewal and reformation. The fact that Harry can do this and the fact that Meghan is 36. You know, the incredible thing is 
she is the age that Diana was when she died. It's a whole different ball game now in the monarchy. There really is a great easiness about it all in the royal family. And he's only five, he's five away from the throne now. You know, it's also easier because now that William has a family and clearly, you know, Harry's not going to get it unless something really strange happens. Uh, there's a sense as well of let Harry be Harry, let Harry have his pick. You know, they're, they're done with trying to force their sons to marry people they don't want to marry. <laughs> right, that's not working. <laughs> that didn't work. So just how revolutionary is Meghan Markle? We asked Susan Ormiston to find out. This was the moment that foretold the future. In royal lingo, a PDA, that is, public display of affection. And with that, Prince Harry in Toronto for the Invictus Games sent a huge signal. Meghan Markle, a biracial, divorced American actress, would be a royal very soon. It's incredibly unique. Um, we've never seen um, a biracial um, person marry into the royal family. And of course, Meghan, who's been um, very out spoken about her biracial heritage is going to become the first um, half black, half white woman to marry into the royal family. So, you know, this is this is ticking so many firsts. Prince Harry will likely never be king, fifth in line. So he was freer to banish the traditions of blue blood, aristocratic royal brides from Britain. But the British tabloids viciously questioned whether Markle was indeed royal jelly, reporting she came from gangland beginnings when in fact she grew up in a middle-class neighborhood in Los Angeles to a white father and a black mother. Pointed questions, too, about her sexy, racy career, Hi. most notably on I'm the Rachel TV Sano. series Give Suits. Last fall, Harry called out columnists and social media trolls for racial undertones and outright sexism. It's a shame that that is the climate in this world to focus that much on that or that that would be discriminatory in that sense. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, I'm really just proud of who I am and where I come from. Long before Harry, Markle shared an interest in humanitarian work. I can see them becoming a, an international duo and traveling around the world and using their celebrity to shine the spotlight on the causes that are close to them. And they actually share a lot of causes in common. But there is a strategic side to this engagement. The royals are a global brand, carefully scripted. Adding Meghan Markle to the team fits. We caught up with Toronto columnist Vicky Mochama. For me personally, it feels wonderful to see this beautiful, smart black woman be loved so publicly and to be embraced by this institution that you don't necessarily think think of as being interesting or complicated when it comes to race. Do you think her joining the royal family will do anything for race relations in Britain or elsewhere? No. <laughs> I want to be as hopeful as anybody else. It's going to require institutional change at a number of different institutions, and whether that happens as a result of one black princess is asking a lot for this one wedding. In an odd way, Marco has not only captured Prince Harry's heart, but help the Windsors appear, well, a tiny bit more reflective of the people they serve. So, Susan, we, we've both covered these royal events. There's always a little bit more to royal weddings than just love. Though, well, right? indeed. I mean, in London, the talk today is, aside from the couple, the happiest person could be the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, because a royal wedding and a royal baby this spring <laughs> will do a lot to take the chill off bad Brexit news and also to give a boost to the UK economy, recently described as grim. And let's remember, Adrian, that... You know, Prince Harry is an A-lister, and this is the last significant royal wedding in Britain we'll see for a very long time, because the next A-lister is Prince George, and he's not yet five years <laughs> old. very little. Okay, Susan, <laughs> thanks very much. So much like Princess Diana and the Duchess of Cambridge, it appears that Meghan Markle already has an influence on fashion. This off-white belted coat is by a Canadian brand named Line. Shortly after today's photo op, the company's website crashed because too many people were trying to buy one. So, Andrew, I know you want to know this. The company says it's now naming the coat the Meghan. <laughs> and, hey, if, there, if there's this much hype over the coat, just wait until we see the wedding dress. <laughs> uh, that's going to be something. You bet. Uh, okay. If you're planning to fly anywhere this holiday season, there are some new airline rules kicking in effective today. 
For starters, you can pack small knives in your carry-on. Emphasis on the word small, though. The blade can't be any longer than six centimeters, which is about the length of your thumb. And all knives are still banned on U.S. flights. Now, also, Transport Canada is banning large quantities of certain powder-like substances in carry-on. So baking and cooking powders, foot powders, baby powders, sand, sea salt, bath salts. You can still bring them on board with you, but if you have anything more than 350 milliliters of the stuff, so about the size of a can of pop, you have to put it in your checked baggage. Ron Charles explains what's behind all the changes. You can actually conceal it in another way. Security consultant Ross McLean demonstrates... And then you can come up and attack someone with the knife. How even a small blade can do major harm. The former Toronto police officer questions the safety of allowing even small blades like this on board planes. These can be sharpened, and in their right hands, they can be used to attack someone in the eyes, slash a face, hook a mouth, a throat. There's a variety of things they can do. But Canada's transport minister disagrees that the small blades pose a danger on aircraft. Our experts have looked at the issue, and uh, we've come to the conclusion that this does not represent a, uh, a risk uh, for the airplane or its passengers. And uh, in fact, we're falling into line with uh, uh, many other countries. Much of Europe allows the small knives. The U.S. is one major destination where all blades are still banned on flights. A plan to allow them was scrapped in 2013 after an outcry from airlines, flight attendants, and air marshals. McLean says one worry there was air rage. Now you introduce where someone may have air rage and they may take out their knife to clean their fingernails or something or just as another threat. As for limiting the amount of baby powder and other dry granular products allowed in carry-on, the transport minister explains they can resemble explosive powders. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. And another story we're following tonight. Officials in London, Ontario, are alerting the public to a mysterious and deadly strep outbreak. The type of strep being spread is called invasive group A streptococcus. And officials say they've learned of more than 132 cases since April of 2016. Of those cases, nearly 30 people have needed intensive care and nine people have died. The bacteria is known to cause mild infections like strep throat, but it can also be life-threatening. Around one in seven people who got sick got what's more commonly known as flesh-eating disease. We're told about half of the cases involve injection drug users or people with unstable housing situations. But a growing number of people getting sick seem to have no connection to that. Health officials say they hope today's alert will help them figure out what's causing the outbreak. An erupting volcano has people on high alert in Bali tonight, including many Canadians. Global Affairs says 403 of them are registered there, and some may be stranded. Authorities confirmed tonight that the island's main airport will stay closed for a second day. The ash you saw spewing from Mount Agung has made it too dangerous to fly. In Washington tonight, a moment in the Oval Office is getting lots of attention. It involves the U.S. president at an event to honor Native American war veterans. He used that moment to mock a U.S. senator, calling her... Pocahontas. And I just want to thank you because you're very, very special people. You were here long before any of us were here. Although we have a representative in Congress who they say was here a long time ago. They call her Pocahontas. So Trump was referring to Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren, and the comment has to do with her still unproven claim of having distant Native American heritage. And while it's not the first time Trump's called her that name, Warren said the timing today was unfortunate and accused Trump of making a racial slur. Something Ian, the uh, White House press secretary says was not the case at all. And we know Donald Trump, Andrew, has taken on the newspaper industry in the United States. A lot of tension back and forth. Uh, here in Canada, a different challenge for that industry. A deal between two newspaper giants is leaving millions of Canadians with less local news coverage, putting hundreds of people out of work and raising some serious questions. Post Media and Torstar announcing that they're swapping a total of 43 properties. The majority, small newspapers in Ontario. Most will be shut down to consolidate operations with what was a competing paper. The companies say all of this will cut costs and maximize ad revenue. 
The deal also includes four free commuter papers in Vancouver, Winnipeg, Toronto and Ottawa. They too will be closed. No cash changed hands, but the deal will cost 290 people their jobs. Ottawa made it clear it won't be offering bailouts when it considers the industry no longer viable, so dozens of communities will wake up tomorrow without a local newspaper, one of them, Barrie, Ontario, that's an hour north of Toronto. Since before Confederation, the Barrie Examiner was a trusted source of information for many in that city. This was the final front page from this morning's paper, that headline open for business about the local ski hill's first day of the season. We went to Barry to set up what we call the red chair, invited people to sit down and ask them what their hometown paper has meant to them. Do I have to take my glasses off? What does the Barry Examiner mean to you or to me? Uh, yeah, I saw this in the news. Well, I enjoy reading it. I just read today something about being cancelled or something, um, which is pretty disappointing because I like to keep in the loop. I grew up reading the Barry Examiner every morning. So I, I grew up in Barry, and we did the crosswords on lunch with my parents. Stories of the, um, the growth and the beauty of our, our town. That's what the Barry Examiner means. Yeah, I've been in it a couple times when I was younger. When I played soccer, my team got put in the Barry Examiner, and then another time when I was in high school um, for dance. I still have newspaper clippings from uh, my daughter and my son doing sports. Uh, my gosh, when I was in grade eight, I was interviewed by the paper uh, for some public speaking I was doing. So it's a huge part of my past as well. Maybe the younger generation, it doesn't affect so much, but people that get up a little bit, I still read the papers. I still read books. I still go along and read all that information, which I won't look it up online. It's a business. People work there. Uh, it's people's jobs and people's livelihoods. So from that standpoint, I see it as quite a shame. This is our town. We need to know what's going on for us. As much as other newspapers cover farther away, you always need to know what's going on at home. As they're closing, we're losing a part of the soul of Barry. And we will be taking that red chair to communities across the country, getting your opinions on issues of the day, then sharing them here on The National. And still ahead on tonight's National, Drake's More Life debuted at number one and broke streaming records. So why won't it be a Grammy contender when nominations are announced tomorrow? We'll talk about the awards troubled history with rap. Plus, remembering Marlene Bird, an Indigenous woman who made headlines, Duncan McHugh revisits her emotional story. And we get rare access to the underground world of human trafficking in Canada in tonight's special national documentary, How Young Canadian Women Are Being Sold for Sex. We need to help them. We need to help these girls. You know, um, they, they're getting brutalized every day. They're getting raped every day. You know, 15, 20 times a day. Uh, they're human beings. You know, they're, they're our children. didn't understand what was happening to me. I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know what it was. I was being trafficked and had no idea there was a word for it. Young, vulnerable, and targeted. We've all heard tragic stories of young girls from around the world seeking a new life in Canada only to be sold into sexual slavery. But you may be surprised to learn who the human traffickers target the most. At least 90% of human trafficking victims come from within Canada, not from abroad and they're young, averaging just 17 years old. It is so serious that all major Canadian community police departments now have resources to fight human trafficking. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this problem is especially acute in Canada's biggest city. But as our Ioana Emiliotis discovered, while Toronto police have declared war on human traffickers, it is a hard fight. Here's her documentary, Canada's Silent Shame.
10.30 a.m. on a Friday. Police are looking for a girl. They don't call it a rescue, but they may as well. Toronto Police's Human Trafficking Unit is the largest in the country. Its mandate, to find young, often underage girls, forced to work in the sex trade. There, there's a good chance that they could be, uh, could be underage. Like this if, is uh, the start of a sting. Officers comb online sex ads, looking for clues of exploitation. When the ad says that they're new to town, what does that suggest? It, it suggests they're, they're being moved from, from city to city, right? So they don't stay in one location uh, for a long period of time. Is that to uh, keep them isolated? Yes, absolutely. Most of the officers work undercover. It's why we can't identify them. One of those criteria of obvious exploitation is branding. Uh, branding? Branding. What does that mean? Branding is where a pimp or um, someone who's controlling the young lady, they have a tattoo applied to their chest or somewhere on their body that's fairly visible to the public. And it shows as if they're the property of the yeah. pimp. You can see on her chest, she has an Air Jordan stamping or tattoo. And these girls are treated as property. They are, 100%. It's an ugly, depraved world. And 95% of the victims trapped in it are Canadian girls. So I'll be doing this live then. To find them, police sometimes pose as clients. So now I'm going to say basically I've landed in Toronto, that I'm going to go to my first meeting and I'd be available for an 11.30 meet where we can attend. So I, have, I received an immediate response mm -hmm. that she was waiting for me. So I'm going to say, how's 11, 11.30? So, it's okay, baby, see you. So the date is set for 11th and 11th The team sets up two fake dates today. Both happen to be in the same hotel, two blocks away from police headquarters. We have two investigative probes lined up for today. Detective uh, Rob Heitzman is in charge of the operation. The He's agreed to show his identity. People inside debriefing. The girls. Human trafficking is all about coercion. Victims have no control, give no consent to trading sex for money. Money they never see. All right, so that one we got to be uh, extra, extra cautious that there's some pimp lurking in the background there. Okay, we got any questions? Left turn, Jen. Good. Good. The officers are armed and bring protective gear. So I sent a text to Sam uh, five minutes out. I'm running uh, a couple minutes late, but I'm on the way. And I'm just waiting for a response, and I haven't had any responses yet. So This officer anyway, set up one of the dates. The, uh, he fills our cameraman in on the plan. Uh, I'll, I'll go into the hotel. You, you can follow me from, from a little bit of a distance. Hopefully before we get there, I'll have a, a room number, and then everybody will be on the, uh, the same page and know exactly where we're going. Okay. Um, now for uh, set him about a minute out with requesting the room number. Okay, we're, we're on the young side and I have the people with me. Okay, Roger. We wait for a response. So she's responding back. Uh, she wants to know my age and my ethnicity. So I told her. Okay, Roger. All right, looks like this uh, could be fluid. So she says, uh, come up to the 15th floor. Okay, Roger. So we're gonna second cover team is gonna go in, me and everybody, and once we're in place, you'll see on Telegram, and then we'll bring it in. Yeah, Roger that. 
The detective doesn't know if he's texting with the young woman in the ad. It could be her pimp. These operations are dangerous. Pimps are often lurking nearby and are often armed. This could be a setup. Several moments go by. Okay, so what happened? Right now, from what I saw when I went in, it doesn't appear that she's underage. Um, she is young, probably early 20s. And the number one thing that we notice is she's not the girl that's in the pictures on back page. So that's another common thing when we set up these probes, you know, based on believing that the girl is underage and that those pictures are the person you're going to meet and again in this case it's a totally different person who's using someone else's photos um, in their ad mm -hmm. and that again is something that we commonly see when we do these probes and when your officers are in there talking to her how mm -hmm. are they trying to establish whether or not she's been trafficked once we get the conversation going we start to get into some of these the, the indicators that maybe she's not in control of what she's doing by asking questions and but it's a rapport thing too right you have to warm up to people you can't just walk in there and say hey you're being trafficked right like that that's gonna lead to zero success so the woman tells police she used to be trafficked but insists she is now an independent sex worker the detectives leave their contact information anyway they sometimes get calls weeks months later in terms of getting disclosures it's not an ideal situation the reality is they're in a hotel room if they're being trafficked they know their pimps nearby um, he's a very at the very least he's on the phone he's checking on them and you know controlling them in that way and a lot of times the pimps are in or near the hotel so it's not ideal for a disclosure that I'm being trafficked. Right. You follow what I'm saying? Because we have so many cases on the go, so many other avenues where we're introduced to victims and disclosures are, are gained that we can't spend a ton of time on this. The unit has nearly 160 cases on the go. I'll talk to you guys after, after the fact. The only other thing we got going on is um, from Project Pineapple. Okay. We have, um, Chris is visiting a victim today at Covenant House. Stings are one way of finding victims. Police also get calls from community groups, frontline officers, and parents. Okay. Sergeant Detective Nunzio Tramontosi runs the unit. How many victims is this with? The um, there's seven victims. Seven victims? I think Sixty percent of the unit's victims the are under 16. So far, the youngest was 12. And you've gotten the, the statement from them, from the girl? Yeah. Okay. These girls are basically the girl next door. That's, that's what they are. They're, they're girls, you know, they could be your, your daughter. They can be your niece, your granddaughter. Um, they come from all walks of life, not just marginalized uh, areas uh, where we do have victims, um, but they come from, you know, parents who are lawyers, doctors, police officers. So it doesn't discriminate at all. Schools, malls, amusement parks, all are predators' hunting ground. And Tramontosi says, increasingly, so is social media. These pimps, they know where to troll. A girl who says on her, on her Facebook account, oh, I'm not feeling so pretty today. They take advantage of that, you know. They'll say, hey, I wish you were my girlfriend. I think you look fine. And that's how it starts. That, that, that process, that luring and grooming process where they exchange telephone numbers now. And then they, they meet and they start talking and they start becoming, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend type of relationship, right? 
where he starts showering gifts on, uh, on the girl. All right? And then, all of a sudden, she's hooked. How long does that take? It doesn't take very long. You know, that, that process uh, usually takes two, three days. That's shocking. Four days. Two to three days for a girl to suddenly be trafficked. Yes, right, and, and it, it's a very small window. And, does and that surprise you? It does, it does. I, I, I never even thought that that could ever happen, but we see it day in and day out, every day here. You know, we've, we've seen yeah. 204 victims here in the last three and a half years, okay? And the story is almost the same for every single one of them. You know, at the, end of, at the end of the day, they're selling these girls a dream. That's what they're doing. The best way I can describe it is I had hit the jackpot. Next on The National, a human trafficking survivor and police rip the veil off the silence. This is the best my life has ever been. Um, I have these people that are going to take care of me. I don't have to worry about anything. The best way I can describe it is I had hit the jackpot. Carly doesn't want us to show her face. She especially doesn't want her grandmother to know. She was a runaway and hooked on heroin when she met her traffickers. They took her in, and she says they took care of her. They asked me about my family. They asked me about my friends. They asked me why I was homeless. They, um, you know, they asked me about my hopes and dreams for the future. I felt so special. How long did that honeymoon phase last? Not long. It didn't take long. My honeymoon stage was maybe two days. At that point, um, her traffickers told her she actually, owed them. Um, she agreed took, to turn tricks um, they, and they lost took, all control. They took my photos. Um, they posted my ad, they put their cell phone number on that ad, um, they took the phone calls, they decided what services I would provide, they decided how many people I would see a day, they decided how much money I would charge. Half the time I had no idea who was coming to my door or for what services. I didn't understand what was happening to me. I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know what it was. I was being trafficked and had no idea there was a word for it. Um, Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, thanks for having us. So I'm Carly. I am a community outreach worker at East Metro Youth Services in our gender-based violence program. Four um, years later, Carly is clean and out of the game, but her story still here. defines her. Um, I got out because of a police officer. Um, and I think it's important to tell this story because he did everything right. A police officer he, found her during so a sting. He, showed up, he booked a fake appointment. Um, he saw my back page ad, he saw the warning signs, so he showed up at my door, he showed his badge, um, and he came in. And he sat there and he spoke to me like I was a human being. Carly he now helps victims of trafficking. She also educates me. frontline officers so they can spot those wrong. victims. She no longer thinks of herself as one, but she still struggles with the shame. The hardest thing for me was that I didn't know or that I agreed to this or that I didn't leave. You know, um, there's a lot of self-blame um, and there's a lot of shame that goes along with uh, working in the sex trade or being involved in a trafficking situation. Carly is ripping the veil off the silence. So are police. Awareness, Tramontosi says, is critical and it feels personal. I think of my daughter. My daughter's 15. You know, my daughter's at that age where they recruit, okay? She's in high school, grade 10. That's what they're looking for. And you know what? When, when I see these girls, that could be my daughter. And that's what drives me. Uh, okay, I think I'm going to go up there and... His message is stark. This crime is about two things and two things only power over the victim, and money, okay? That is it. The money well, we is staggering. Money Pimps make at least $250,000 a year off every victim, hand hand. So and they often have what they call a stable of girls. Well, we have pimps that are driving Bentleys, Ferraris, Maseratis, uh, and they're out there because they're making that much money. Uh, from these girls. And remember, the girls girl, don't get a cent. You're gonna be my they barely get a meal a day. Yeah, 
you want to make sure that no other girl has to go through this, right? And it does, it keeps you up at night. It really does. We need to help them. We need to help these girls, you know. Um, they, they're getting brutalized every day. They're getting raped every day, you know, 15, 20 times a day. Uh, they're human beings, you know, they're, they're our children. Our objective for today is to identify individuals who are willing to make purchases of underage girls, so obtaining to purchase uh, sexual services of an individual under the age of 18. Since the Human Trafficking Unit was created in 2014, detectives have made more than 250 arrests and laid more than 1,700 charges. They've nailed pimps and Johns too. That's who they're after today. Okay, guys on the teams, just so one last point. The hotel doesn't know we're operating in their, their facility, and we're just going to leave it at that. We meet up with officers at an East End hotel. So this would be an arrest um, takedown area. This is an operational room. Everybody in here has a specific role, making sure that we're safe, that you know a gang of rival traffickers aren't coming in here with machine guns and machetes to, to attack us, right? Who are you posing as? So I'm posing as a 20-year-old girl. The officers have posted their own fake ad. The girl in it is 20. But soon after any transaction begins, she will reveal she's actually 17. Yes, you're acting as a 17-year-old um, person that's selling sex, but the reality is we're gathering evidence. Like, that's what we're doing here. The ad goes live. We're asked to leave the room. Police say most potential Johns back out when they realize they're engaging with someone so young, but one doesn't. This man thinks he's on his way to have sex with a 17-year-old girl. He's arrested as soon as he walks into the hotel room. He showed up as he promised, and he was surveilled up to this location where he was arrested by an arrest team inside of the room. I look at it like a triangle. I look at it as there's victims, there's traffickers, pimps, and there's the purchaser, the peop people that are buying the service. And each person has a role in, in these types of investigations. Um, and yes, we want to do everything we can for victims. That's why we're doing the work. That's why all these people are doing the work. Um, at the same time, we, we definitely take serious the, the fact that we need to lock these guys up. The man is escorted out the back entrance, taken to a nearby police station. That's where he'll be booked with attempting to have sex with a minor. Joanna Rumiliotis, CBC News, Toronto. And Joanna Rumiliotis joins us now. I'm sure a lot of parents are watching and, and wondering how can they spot the warning signs? They're pretty obvious um, in terms of inappropriate clothing. For example, a young girl dressing inappropriately, suddenly having very expensive clothing or jewelry or a designer handbag, something that would be out of reach financially for a person that young. Also, if most of these cases, it's a relational thing, right? So they identify their trafficker as their boyfriend, yet they're reluctant to bring them home. Those are the kind of warning signs that police say parents have to have uh, keep an eye out for. And what do police say parents can do in that situation? First off, they say be very aware of what your kid is up to. Be very aware of what they do on social media, because that's a huge hunting ground for these predators. Communicate with your kids. And something really old-fashioned, be unconditionally loving of your child, because they say that's a huge part of the reason these victims are so vulnerable. And ultimately, if these worry signs are coming up, call the police. They get a lot of calls from parents, and that's what they follow up on. All right, Joanna, thank you. You're welcome. And as Joanna discovered, one of the best weapons human traffickers have is a lack of public knowledge on how they operate. But you can arm yourself with information, explore our online companion piece, Hidden Crimes, cbcnews.ca slash the national. On the National Tonight, a warm welcome for Pope Francis in Myanmar. But the world is waiting to see what, if anything, he might say publicly about the Rohingya refugee crisis. Tomorrow, he's expected to meet the country's de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi.
A wooden boat with eight decomposed bodies washed ashore in northern Japan. According to local media, officials think the people on board may have been defectors from North Korea. There's been a string of similar cases lately. Over the weekend, two other bodies were discovered. Mm -hmm. I'm in love with the shape of you. We push and pull like a magnet do. Ed Sheeran's is one of those familiar names you can expect to hear tomorrow morning when the Grammy nominations are announced. He's already being singled out as a contender for Album of the Year, but there's one megastar that probably won't be mentioned. Canadian rapper Drake. His most recent album reportedly wasn't even submitted for consideration. And as Eli Glasner tells us, that could have more to do with the awards themselves than the album. Drake calls More Life a playlist. The industry calls it an album. But whatever it is, More Life is popular. When it debuted, it broke the record for most streams in a single week. So why not submit it for a Grammy? Flashback to February, where Drake vented his frustrations with the Grammys for overlooking hotline bling in the pop category. The only category that they can manage to fit me in is in a rap category because... Maybe because I've rapped in the past or because I'm black. When it comes to appreciating hip hop, historically, the Grammys have been out of tune. Some of the greatest rap iconoclasts in the history of the music form, yeah. like Public Enemy, Tupac Shakur, Notorious B.I.G., and it goes on and on, have never won a Grammy Award. So when we talk about the history of the Grammys and engaging rap constituencies, it's been poor from the jump. Let me break it down for you again. In the best album category, the only hip hop artists that have won are Lauryn Hill, an outcast, and rap has never won in the best song or record categories. Tasha the Amazon is part of a new wave of Canadian rappers and not a Grammy fan. It's run by uh, gatekeepers that really have no relevance in rap music right now. Like many, she finds her fans on streaming sites such as Spotify. As the music industry switches to digital sales, the popularity of hip hop is becoming clearer. This summer, Nielsen Music reported that in the U.S., hip-hop and R&B dethroned rock music as the most popular genre. Whether it's the Grammys in the U.S. or Canada's Juno Awards, hip-hop boosters say award shows that don't televise rap categories are missing an opportunity. So that's why you have, you know, the disrespect of people winning, but they don't win a televised award, even though those ones that are not televised could be the biggest awards of the whole night and the most relevant especially if you're talking about youth culture. Until the awards change, artists like Drake will let their sales speak for them. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. We'll go deeper on the stories of the day earlier in the day. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash the national. The National Today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon. Tonight, we are marking the death of Marlene Bird, the indigenous Saskatchewan woman endured unspeakable trauma, including a brutal attack on the street that brought her to national attention. Duncan McHugh was touched by the fact that despite all her suffering, Marlene Bird also found love. Tonight, he looks back on her life. Her final days were here at Prince Albert Hospital. A fighter with her family and partner, Patrick Lavallee, at her side. She was a very strong woman, strong-willed, and uh, she did a lot of uh, help with a lot of people. Marlene Bird's name became headline news, victim of a crime that shocked the country. A homeless Cree woman in Prince Albert, beaten, assaulted, set on fire. She survived but lost part of her eyesight and both her legs. Her injuries were horrific. Go get it. But this is how I remember her, enjoying time with Patrick. <laughs> her laughter, her quick tongue. I did a documentary with Marlene in 2014, six months after she was assaulted. I wanted to know her story. It turned out to be heart-wrenching. I'm cold on my legs. Learning what Marlene had faced and survived, a difficult story to hear. It was challenging to share visually, too, so we brought in a graphic artist to illustrate Marlene's youth, growing up in a family that abused alcohol, life at residential school, 
where she was sexually abused. There were men in her life who beat her. Her two daughters were apprehended. It all led to life on the streets, then that vicious assault. Marlene's injuries were life-changing. She struggled to adjust to a wheelchair, to find a home, to pay bills. The trauma drove her to drink. I don't mean to have self-pity, but I miss my legs. But eventually, she and Patrick, homeless for so long, got a house in the northern community of Timber Bay. Being an amputee was a dark cloud over her life. Their love story was a silver lining. Her attacker pleaded guilty to attempted murder. But Leslie Black's case dragged on for months, then years. Marlene often attended court. Finally, this September, he was sentenced to 16 years in jail. Marlene was satisfied. Uh, doing my best, because my mom told me to forgive people that do wrong. So I learned it from my mom. I think I could forgive him. But the court process, the retelling, brought fresh pain. She was drinking again, on and off. She ended up in hospital, her liver and kidneys failing. Marlene Bird died today, 50 years old. And I dream about myself having legs, and I wake up and then I got no legs. I dream about myself walking far like I used to. Duncan McHugh. CBC News. That's a national for November 27th. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good night. Thanks.